Hello everybody, it's 6 o'clock now. So welcome uh, to all to the 8th Annamani lecture, which is being delivered by Professor Abhasur from MIT USA. So as many of you know, the Annamani lecture series is part of the ongoing effort by the Working Group for Gender Equity, WGGE, of the Astronomical Society of India, ASI, for increasing gender sensitization in the astronomy community in India. The first Annamani lecture was delivered by Rama Govinda Rajan, uh, on Science While Female. Uh, this was in April 2016 at NCRA. And the most recent lecture was delivered by Meera Nanda on running an obstacle uh, race with miles still to go. This was in March of this year, just before the pandemic. And this was also at NCRA. A little bit about Anamani, after whom this uh, lecture series is based. Anamani was a pioneering Indian physicist and a meteorologist who carried out path-breaking research in 1950s India against all odds. After completing her undergraduate degree in physics from Presidency College in Madras, she undertook research at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. She worked with C.V. Raman on the spectroscopy of diamonds and rubies and published five single author papers. However, she was not granted a PhD degree by Madras University on the pretext that she did not have a master's degree. Ignoring the fact that she had obtained a scholarship for graduate studies on the basis of her undergraduate degree. So after this, she took up an internship to study physics because that was her primary interest at the Imperial College in London. But she ended up in specializing on meteorological instrumentation instead. Uh, she returned to India in 1948 and joined the Indian Meteorological Department, IMD, at Pune. And in 1976, she retired as the Deputy Director General of IMD and subsequently returned to the Raman Research Institute as a visiting professor for several years. During her career as a meteorologist, Anamani helped in setting up instruments for studying the ozone layer and wind energy, as well as a millimeter wave telescope at Nandi Hills to study solar radiation. She wrote two books on solar radiation. Our speaker today is Professor Abhasur from MIT. Abhasur is a scientist turned historian of science she received her PhD in physical chemistry from Vanderbilt University and postgraduate training in the field of multi-photon ionization spectroscopy at SUNY Stony Brook and at Yale University. She has published several articles in chemistry. Her more recent research focuses on the history of modern science in India from a subaltern perspective. Her book, her very famous book, Dispersed Radiance, Caste, Gender and Modern Science in India, examines the confluence of caste, nationalism, and gender in science, and unpacks the colonial context in which science was organized. Abbasur has been a fellow at the Bunting Institute at Harvard University and at the Dibner Institute for History of Science and Technology at MIT. She's presently a lecturer in the program in Women's and Gender Studies and a research associate in the program in Science, Technology, and Society at MIT. Today, Abhar uh, Sur is going to talk about Extraordinary Ordinary R. Rajalakshmi's Life in Science. And she's joining us today from Boston. So the, before I turn the floor, virtual floor to you, Abha, I just want to request everybody to keep uh, their uh, cameras off and, as well as their mics. And the uh, plan is to have uh, Abha speak first and then we'll have a discussion, a question answer uh, session at the end. If you have uh, burning questions, please type them in the chat window and I will uh, direct them to Abha. So with that, let's uh, get started. Abha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Preeti, for um, inviting me to, this, to deliver this lecture. Of course, I have a very special bond with Anna Mani. I met her in 1992, and in fact, it's the first scientific uh, history of science paper that I wrote, uh, my work on Anna Mani. And I just want to share with you this uh, very interesting way in which Anna Mani introduced um, uh, me to, um, let me kind of, so she introduced me to, um, to, um, to her colleague, she looked at me um, and she said, uh, meet Dr. Sur, she's from, in, uh, she's from America and thinks I'm history. And so, of course, I was kind of taken aback. She was 
you know, she was known for her stern outlook and all of that. So I quickly regained my composure and said, no, 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 I don't think you're history. I think you are maker of history. And that kind of softened her immediately. And after that, we had a really delightful time. I was in Bangalore for about more than a week and I saw her very often and learned from her many, many things about her life, which I was able to write um, in a paper called actually Dispersed Radiance, that was the topic. So anyway, so I, it's a particular delight for me to be speaking um, in this lecture series. So today I'm going to talk about the life uh, of um, our Raja Lakshmi. And I, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Megha Harish. She did, uh, she wrote her um, master's thesis in philosophy on women scientists in India. And it is through that, that I was able to um, learn about Raja Lakshmi. You know, it's very hard uh, to actually think about, um, you know, to, to, to actually learn about women, especially in early part of the 20th century. There were quite a number of women, though numerically still very small, but uh, how do we recover those histories has remained an issue because, you know, there are no archives, etc. That one can go to. And if there are archives, of course, people keep those quite well um, hidden from scholars. So anyway, I um, so today I want to um, talk to you about uh, our Raja Lakshmi. So um, in an autobiographical essay published in Women Scientists, The Road to Liberation, our Raja Lakshmi captures the salience of gender differentiation in India. She writes, in the India of my childhood, the autobiography of a woman was likely to be very different from that of a man. The difference cuts across the entire hierarchy of that socioeconomic system, which is fossilized into a part hereditary system called caste. The liberty which women have enjoyed through the ages varies with social class and perhaps follows a U-shaped distribution. Women have always worked with men as farm laborers, construction workers, and the like, but the proportion in the professional group is a different manner. So you could see here in this short paragraph, she's kind of talked about so many things and you, you can just look into her mind to see how she's connecting various things. And I, as you will see from her life history, that she's done all kinds of very interesting things. She's worked with, you know, uh, poor women. She's worked with um, Dalit children. She's done all kinds of work. And her own life is a testament to the fact that she actually is a living embodiment of what we call today as intersectionality, that she's always linking the issue of gender in this, uh, in this, you know, it's a short autobiographical essay, but the fact that she mentions working class women, Dalit, uh, you know, the caste angle, etc., shows a mind that is alert to the social dimension very much. So I, so in these few words, Raja Lakshmi posits a profound understanding of gender relations in India. Not only does she allude to the interlocking system of class, caste, and gender, she also seems cognizant that these relations are not reflections of human nature written in stone. Rather, they have particular histories and trajectories. Importantly, she emphasizes the fact that women have always worked alongside men by paying attention to all echelons of the society rather than concentrating exclusively upon the lives of middle-class women. Further, she's aware of her unique position as a woman scientist in an era where women in higher education, let alone in the sciences, were far and few in between. So anyway, so I think that often when we think about professional women, we are the first, we are getting out of the house, we overlook the fact that working women have always, always worked. Um, and that is an important thing that I, I think we must be or should be aware of and how we begin to 
uh, you know, forge uh, solidarities uh, is, uh, is an important aspect, in, uh, for me at least. The erasure of class difference from the narrative of women in mainstream writings on gender and science has, proved, has as I would argue, precluded a deeper understanding of the marginalization of professional women. So the improbability of women scientists in colonial India can be gauged by the state of women's education in the early decades of the 20th century. In 1917, there were only 14 high schools for girls in the entire Bengal presidency, whose female population stood at 22 million. Can you imagine 14 high schools for 22 million women? The number of female students enrolled in the upper four grades of high school was 491, and in colleges and universities, 144. And this uh, information comes from the Calcutta University Commission report. Bombay and Madras presidencies posted similar st statistics, emphasizing the abysmal state of higher education for women. The paucity of high schools aside, education for girls was tailored to reproduce um, prevalent gender hierarchies and relations where women's interests were always secondary to men's and their primary role in society was to be mothers and wives. Tertiary education for women was to serve two purposes. One aimed at fulfilling the needs of the state where strict sex sexual segregation of the Indian society demanded and created opportunities for women teachers and medical doctors. The second, no less important, was to provide suitable companionship to their educated husbands to be efficient mothers, etc. In this um, scenario, a career in science did not loom large for the few women who pursued higher education. Yet, women did pursue science, some more successfully than others, but their life's histories have remained unexplored. The telling of a life story is a con confirmation of the self that stands there telling the story. History, on the other hand, might offer uh, the chance of denying it, writes Carolyn Steedman in her autobiographical essay, landscape for a good woman. Indeed, the historical improbability of the figure of a woman scientist stands in contrast to the lived reality of the women who defied the odds. It also explains their absence from traditional histories of science that reward men for their unique stances, but uh, renders unconventional women, especially those uh, whose very lives seemingly resist hegemonic structures of class, caste, and gender invisible. This lack of institutional recognition has contributed to a large measure to the relative obscurity of women scientists from the history of modern science. Um, and in this respect, you know, just now when you were telling me about Mila Nanda's talking, you know, exploring women from the antiquity to the present, and there are other people who've been writing about it, Londa Schiebinger for once in the US has written a very interesting book, uh, you know, detailing the lives of scientists all across Europe, largely. Until the mid 1970s, historical biographical studies on women scientists were few. However, with the rise of the feminist movement and in the mid decades of the 20th century came innovations in both history of science and science itself, where much awaited inclusion of women in historical accounts began to happen. And in my opinion, led to a deeper understanding of the discipline of science. We then begin to uh, think about uh, the ways uh, the, the, the culture of science itself precludes women. There's a high attrition rate and it doesn't have to do with capabilities, but rather to the atmosphere, the general atmosphere created in laboratories where issues of 
um, you know, what marginality, whether it's gender or caste or class, are kind of taboo to discuss. And because they've been sort of, uh, we've created, uh, 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 you know, a kind of picture of science as above all of these issues. Um, um, feminist scientists uh, turned a critical eye towards their disciplines and noted egregious methodologies, unfounded assertions about women's intellectual development, as well as unconscious bias in advancing theories detrimental to gender equality. So today, in, uh, change is in the air, but women's scholarship remains marginalized. Um, there are scant records of women's scientific achievements, almost no institutional archives, and no personal papers accessible to historians. In this milieu, scientists have to piece together oral histories, correspondence from famous male scientists, um, um, housed in largely Western archives, um, and personal contacts with family members wherever possible to recover the lives of these remarkable women. Um, here, I want to now acknowledge um, a very valuable contrib uh, contribution in recent years. Lee Lavati's Daughters, the publication of that has been, uh, you know, it's, it's short biographical, autobiographical essays. And yet I would think that later on, when people begin to work on these scientists, that would be a very important resource. And therefore, we need many, many, many such um, interventions, I would say. Um, and I think we need many such efforts to ensure a more inclusive understanding of the history of science. One um, that coalesces feminist consci consciousness of women scientists, as well as captures the changing need of the modern state. Today, I want to introduce you to the life and times of Raja Lakshmi, our Raja Lakshmi, to highlight the particular problems women scientists encounter. Her story is both particular and general in that her own resilience, innovative spirit and ingenuity notwithstanding, most women scientists um, would, sorry, uh, her story is both particular and general in that her own resilience, innovative spirit and ingenuity notwithstanding, most women scientists would readily identify with the treatment meted out to her in the hallowed halls of science. So let me give you a, 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 her brief biography. Um, our Raja Lakshmi was born in a middle-class family in 1926. The third of seven children, Raja Lakshmi took progressively increasing responsibilities uh, for the home and the rearing of the young children. Her mother suffered from bouts of asthma, thus the care of her young siblings, including their education, fell on her shoulders. Raja Lakshmi writes, and I quote, her life as a housewife and teacher started at the age of 12 and has continued till now. And I'll return to this, you know, the, what we call the reproductive sphere, the sphere of the home, where all kind of care work is done by women for which there is no compensation, no remuneration, etc. cetera. And, and I think that really is an important issue to think through. Um, Raja Lakshmi loved school and was herself, and I quote, a reasonably good student. Uh, in that she had many firsts, but seldom ever a first rank on the whole. School seemed to bring out her rebellious spirit. She often defied instructions, writing in Tamil when expected to turn in um, the work in English and using Roman script for dictations in Tamil. No wonder she never got the first, given the you know, strict control teachers like to have on students. Um, in school, she came into her own, well-liked by students and teachers alike. She became quite unlike, quote, 
the dumb girl her relatives thought she was. One of them called me cat and later clay cat, she wrote. Since the lives of, uh, since live ones, the, li the live kittens um, mew uh, once, sometimes mew. So she was so subdued in the home atmosphere that, um, you know, her, um, her relatives thought of her as not just a cat, but a clay cat. Her school years were marked by political fervor all over India. Leaders such as, and I'm quoting directly from her autobiography, leaders such as Gandhi, Nehru, Rajaji, and Sarojini Naidu addressed public meetings in Madras that made her want to drive out the British. She did her bit by organizing a total strike and a procession in August of 1940. But she kept quiet after that as her father threatened to stop her schooling altogether if she continued with her political activism. You know, so again, you see uh, as something that a lot of women feel that they're, you know, you're either under the, uh, you know, sort of disciplinary eye of your father or then it transfers to the husband. So there's never a time when women can really come into their own. Um, Okay, so, so she had to quit her political activism because her father threatened to uh, put, take her out of school altogether. Raja Lakshmi joined Vardia College in Pune for an undergraduate degree in science in 1941. Her father had been transferred there during the Second World War. World War II shifted her sympathies to the British as the Allies fought against fascism and Nazism but at the same time, the Quit India movement by, led by Gandhi in the August of 1942 inspired her as well. So she writes, it was perhaps easiest to sit this one out and concentrate on her education instead. She studied mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, and English. There were only six girls out of a class of 200 that year, in her first year. By the time she graduated with a mathematics degree with physics as a subsidiary, she was the only girl in her, school, in her class. She found um, college days to be isolating and quite lonely. So you can imagine a single woman with strict taboos about how, who you can talk to, etc. I mean, those kinds of taboos were there in my time in Delhi University, where a large number of women would just not speak to men at all, uh, because that's the way they were brought up. And if they got hesitancy, there was also shyness, and there was also this fear of the, the pressure from home, uh, uh, you know, uh, would be, you know, sort of, um, it wouldn't be taken uh, very well if they were to develop friendships with uh, young men in their class. Um, uh, there was no communication with men um, in her class and little to say to the few women students in Bhatia College as they came from social backgrounds and political views markedly different from her own. So again, you know, you see this rebellion, rebellious young woman who, uh, there are no men that she can talk to because that's the taboo. And she can't really uh, connect with women either who come from very different socioeconomic backgrounds and were really not interested in the kind of issues that, uh, you know, sort of fired her imagination. Um, in the intermediate examinations at the college, she missed the gold medal given to the first class first. With an impish sense of humor, Raja Lakshmi recounts in her autobiography that, quote, several years later, she got possession of the medal by marrying the winner. And uh, so um, Raja Lakshmi had intended to join Ferguson College for a master's degree in mathematics upon graduation, but had to shelf the idea in order to look after her parents in Bangalore, who had become seriously ill. So again, you know, and we, you know, she has to constantly remake herself depending on the circumstances out 
of her control in a way. Um, by the time her parents recovered, the term was half over. She then started working as a science teacher in Kanchipuram. Initially, she had thought of working there only for a semester, but ended up staying three years. Uh, as her students, as well as the school administrators, implored her not to leave. She, she writes, they would pray at the local temple for her to stay. One of them even broke a coconut in appreciation of the deity's intervention. So she kind of gave in to the pressure of her colleagues and her students and continued to teach for three years. Apart from teaching, her time in Kanchipuram was spent in public service. Here she tried to follow Gandhi's 14 point constructive program, which aimed at improving conditions in the villages through spread of literacy, environmental, sanitation, afforestation, etc. And here you see a lot of the women who grew up in this era, including Anamani, how influential that movement was in, you know, and that really molded them in ways that, that, that we sort of don't see uh, these days and hopefully they will return because there's a lot to work, a lot of work to be done. Um, outside. In addition to her paid work as a science teacher, she volunteered to teach boys from an industrial school for Harijans, she writes, on Sundays. She gave Hindi lessons to matriculate girls, organized extramural classes in nutrition in her own school, and at the same time, furthered her own education by learning Tamil from an eminent scholar in the area. In addition, she took up lessons in Vina and attended many political and literary meetings, including some organized by DMK. So you can see, I mean, just when I just read about this, I'm just kind of how many, how rich and how, uh, you know, her life was. There's nothing that she couldn't do. And she found time to do all of this, um, you know, so it's, what a remarkable uh, life she had. In Kanchipuram, she also made acquaintance with Ramakrishna, her future husband and gold medalist, who had been at Badia College at the same time as her. In Pune, of course, they, the two had never spoken to each other. So after three years, Raja Lakshmi left Kanchipuram for Madras to enroll herself in a teacher training program at well Wellington College and subsequently taught at a girls' school in Chidambaram. While teaching there, she sat for the IAS examination in which she did quite well in the written part, but not so uh, well in the interview. Um, and again, you know, we can only surmise what that would be like, somebody who comes from uh, a middle-class family, um, you know, sort of interviews are all about trying to establish where you come from, how you speak English, how, what you do, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, people who don't come from metropolitan areas with public school education don't tend to fare well in these kinds of interviews. Anyway, um, however, uh, her independent studies into philosophy history and political science in preparation for the IAS examination made her eligible for a master's degree in philosophy, which she subsequently obtained from Banaras Hindu University in 1953. So you just begin to see the extraordinarily broad range of her interest, of her scholarship, and the, the way in which she utilizes every opportunity or every missed opportunity into uh, furthering her own development in a way and sort of moving ahead. And just can you imagine somebody who's doing science on the one hand, doing and then philosophy, um, etc. cetera, um, at the same time. In nine, the, the 1950s were eventful years in her life. In 1951, Raja Lakshmi married L Ramakrishnan who was about to leave for Madison, Wisconsin for a year long research fellowship. During this time, 
Raja Lakshmi gave birth to her first child, Venkatraman. Venkatraman would later recall this period in his novel address as follows. When I was born, he writes, my father, C. V. Ramakrishnan, was away on a postdoctoral fellowship in Madison, Wisconsin, with the famous en enzymologist en with, with David Green, because he came because he came from a poor family. He did not think that he could support my mother and me on his postdoctoral income, so he went alone. I often joke that but for this, I would have been born in Madison and could have gone on to become president of the United States. In fact, I first saw my father when I was about six months old. My mother, R. Raja Lakshmi, taught at Annamalai University in Chidambaram. And, um, and during the day, I was well cared for by aunts and grandparents in the usual way of an extended Indian family. When I was about a year and a half, my father left again, this time with my mother, to go to Ottawa on a National Research Council fellowship. They returned a little over a year later, and during their absence, I was brought up by my grandmother and my aunt Gomathi, to whom I remain close to this day. So you see, I mean, here you see in Raja Lakshmi's family that it takes a village to raise a child. The entire family and extended family, you know, uh, you know, uh, were, were there to look after um, Ramakrishnan. And uh, you know, and it's a, in some ways a remarkable story about both Raja Lakshmi and the kind of support that she gave herself as a young uh, girl. And then, you know, to see that the family came together for her when she needed their help in, uh, you know, this reproductive labor. In Ottawa, Raja Lakshmi found a teaching position at an exclusive girls' school. Teaching philosophy and methods in Canada differed substantially from her teaching experience in India. She was intrigued by the Canadian education system of which she made a systematic study, making full use of the local libraries. On her return to India in 1954, she was able to find a teaching position in the University of Annamalai in mathematics and psychology, where she taught, quote, male students who were her contemporaries in age. So, so wherever she goes, she finds new things to get excited about, to learn, etc. So never a dull moment in her life. In the meantime, her husband, who'd been offered yet another research position at McGill University, as was appointed reader and head of the Department of Biochemistry in Baroda University. So I think uh, Raja Lakshmi had looked forward to going to Canada. Uh, but because he got a permanent job, he was reluctant to go. And so they it was an offer Ramakrishnan could not refuse, and thus Raja Lakshmi followed him reluctantly to Baroda, now Vadodra. Raja Lakshmi recounts not being too happy in Baroda. Instead of an independent teaching position, she now helped out her husband in the drafting of his research proposals. Yet Raja Lakshmi persisted with furthering her own education. And, and, you know, she had decided she was really looking forward to going to um, uh, McGill. And so she continued to apply uh, for uh, uh, to admissions into their graduate school. So, and succeeded finally. So in 1956, um, Adaja Lakshmi left for McGill to pursue a PhD in psychology, leaving her for, uh, four and a half year old son behind. Um, she finished her degree in record time. And again, I want to quote from Venkatraman, his recollections of this period. Um, and he writes, unusually for an Indian man of his generation, my father being aware of my mother's intellectual abilities encouraged her to go abroad by herself to obtain a PhD she 
to, to obtain a PhD. She obtained a fellowship at McGill University to a PhD in psychology, where one of her mentors um, was the famous psychologist Donald Hebb, whose theories presaged modern ideas about synaptic plasticity as the basis for memory and behavior. Probably because she felt guilty about leaving my father and me behind, she finished her PhD in under 18 months, which must have been something of a record. When she returned, she could not find a suitable position in the psychology department in Baroda. Instead, she used her analytical skills to help my father in his research, working initially as a CSIR pool officer, which was a temporary scheme by the government of India to support scientists returning from abroad. This was the beginning of a lifelong collaboration in their work. My childhood and adolescence were filled with visiting scientists from both India and abroad, many of whom would stay with us. A life of science struck me as being both interesting and particularly international in character. So that's what Venkat Raman writes in his novel, novel address. Indeed, Raja Lakshmi did finish a PhD in 18 months, but under duress. And I quote from her autobiography, under duress as, quote, her husband having pressed her to leave for Montreal was now pressing her to come back as soon as possible. So, so this respite for or respite for about, um, you know, 18 months uh, was all that she was granted. She needed to get back because there were, the, you know, home to be looked after and her husband's career to, to um, you know, to, to, to further. In December 1957, Raja Lakshmi Ramakrishnan submitted her PhD dissertation on comparative effects of successive and simultaneous presentations on transfer in verbal learning to the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research. This was no ordinary task for Raja Lakshmi, for Raja Lakshmi had joined the graduate program at McGill only 18 months prior to submitting her thesis. Can you imagine coming to an entirely new place, being in introduced to a different system altogether, doing immense amount of coursework, working on her dissertation project, writing it all up and doing everything. I mean, it is just mind boggling to me. In this short period of time, Raja Lakshmi had taken many more courses than required by the program and had excelled in all of them. In addition, she finished the experimental part of her thesis in record time, about four months, by working incredibly hard. The head of the Department of Psychology at McGill, as we heard already before, was Donald Hepp, the renowned psychologist um, and neuroscientist, who not only took the training of graduate students very seriously, but also held fairly unconventional views on education that valued originality and imagination over rote learning. Hepp was satisfied both with Raja Lakshmi's performance in her coursework, as well as with the quality of her research and waived the two-year residency requirement um, that the university required of its graduate students. So you can imagine, I mean, um, the, the, I mean, if you think about it in today's, uh, you know, atmosphere at all, where we are, get so stressed about things, and here is this woman, you know, working incredibly hard, doing, you know, sort of long, arduous experiments on subjects, and, you know, finishing all of that, doing her coursework, and all, you know, it's, it's really, uh, and I can't imagine that things were any easier. You know, we could say, oh, we have to do so much more these days. I doubt it somehow. I think it just shows a, a kind of resilience that is quite extraordinary. However, despite the impeccable reputation of McGill University Psychology Department and her stellar record in her graduate studies there, 
Raja Lakshmi returned to the city of Baroda unemployed with little prospect for continuing her own research. Lack of employment opportunities for highly trained women scientists, unfortunately, was common not only in India, but also across the world. Dorothy Needham, uh, a biochemist, captures the ethos of that era. And I quote from Dorothy Needham, looking back over my 45 years in research, I find it remarkable, especially from the point of view of contemporary practice, that although a fully qualified and full-time investigator, I never received or even applied for any substance, substantive post. I simply existed on one research grant after another, devoid of position, rank, or assured em emolument. In other words, I belonged to a generation for whom it was calmly assumed that married women would be supported financially by their husbands, and if they chose to work in the laboratory all day and half the night, it was their own concern. Moral support I received consistently from Joseph, her husband, but it was never in his power to give me the self-respect which comes from a recognized and established position. Despite being highly acclaimed scientist, she was elected, Dorothy um, Needham, she was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 1948 and was an honorary fellow of both Keyes College and Gritton College at the University of Cambridge. Dorothy Needham was never ever offered a faculty position. So, so I'm just trying to say that there are parallels. You, you, it's not that it is peculiar at that time to India. It was the position of women throughout the world, it seems, perhaps not in the socialist world where you do see women um, being hired a little bit more, but you know, I, we'd have to look into that a little bit more. Raja Lakshmi too returned to India more trained than ever and yet without a job. She started to assist in her husband's department where she taught courses in statistics and helped students in their PhD dissertations. As she became more familiar and conversant in the area of biochemistry, yet another subject that she had to learn, she began to offer advice on interpretation of their results. Soon she won their respect. She writes, the early PhD students who were all male and those whose thesis writings, uh, thesis writing I supervised, tended to look down on me at first. But uh, this condensation turned to either admiration or resentment when I was able to point out technical and logical errors and offer interpretations which they had not thought of. So you, you know that this again is a mixed bag for her. You know, there's resentment and how come this woman is going to tell us how we should be doing our work. And at the same time, she has a formidable intellect and you cannot kind of ignore it in any case. During this time, Raja Lakshmi applied for and received an honorary research worker's position that had no remuneration. The position allowed her to study the effects of nutritional def deficient, deficiency on psychological performance and brain chemistry. She also developed a program to study the secretion of absorbic acid during lactation. Um, eventually, her work was recognized, especially by Dr. G. Raj N. Mehta, who was then the finance minister of the undivided Bombay state and was also a syndicate member of the university. So knowing him opened up some doors for her and she was eventually able to obtain a grant from the University Research Foundation. She also submitted an extensive research project to the Human Nutrition Div Division of USDA, uh, US Department of Agriculture, notwithstanding her husband's skepticism because these were highly um, competitive uh, grants and nobody in their 
you know, nobody thought she would get it, but despite the highly competitive nature of these grants, her proposal got funding, much to the surprise, but much to her own surprise, and of course the surprise of our uh, colleagues as well. In 1959, Raja Lakshmi gave birth to a baby girl, Lalita, now a scientist at Cambridge University, and subsequently accompanied her husband to Australia, where he was a Rockefeller visiting fellow. Once again, Raja Lakshmi had to fend for herself in a totally different environment. She was able to obtain a position of a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Adelaide. Here too, at least initially, she felt a bit out of place. As the staff there was all male, except for one professor. Consequently, all social interactions centered around sports. And so far, we haven't heard anything about Raja Lakshmi that prepares her for uh, you know, carrying on conversations on sports. Nevertheless, she persevered and made lasting contributions to both research and teaching. So, and, and in that short period she was there, she made uh, enough of a mark so that a commemorative history of psychology school at Adelaide universities mentions her contribution. And they write in their uh, thing, behind Professor Norman Munn's planning for research on these animals was his desire to contribute relevant information on an issue in which Professor Jeeves and some of his associates, including visiting Indian psychologist, Mrs. Raja Lakshmi, were involved. This issue concerned what would be called a reversal index. So what I just wanted to quote from it, just to tell you that in that short period she was there, getting to know this new culture, doing all kinds of looking after her children, she also managed to make substantial contribution to science. Moon explained that the literature on animal learning contains many studies in which after learning to discriminate between two patterns, where response to one is rewarded, the reversal discrimination is learned, that is with previously negative stimulus now rewarded. So the kind of uh, experiment she does was that they learn to discriminate between two patterns and then they switch it. And so the pattern, if you, uh, if you recognized it, you were given a reward. Now you would be you know, punished for that and the reward was shifted to the other one. Um, um, it is most often found that in such research that many more trials are required and many more errors made in learning the second than the number of trials involved in learning the first, right? So this is a, a, a complicated set of experiments that she was doing, but these are also very interesting um, in their own right, because um, she, she writes that these kinds of experiments might provide a phylogenetically useful indication of animal intelligence. So, you know, and what she draws from her research at that time is that she, the study prompted her to remark with a touch of amusement that intelligence should be defined, defined as an unlearning capacity. So learning is fairly straightforward, but unlearning, as we can all say, as we get old and get set in our habits, is a much more complicated task. And in her, and, and the way in which she understands it is that it is, uh, you know, it's much more, it should be the indi indicator for intelligence, the unlearning rather than the learning itself. In addition to research, Raja Lakshmi took on teaching responsibilities. At Adelaide, and I'm quoting from her my autobiography. At Adelaide, I was asked to take a certain number of classes. I was rash enough, take meaning teach, I was rash enough to leave the choice of the subject to the students who made all kinds of choices, including mental abnormal abnormality, which I had never studied, and the latest advances in neurophysiology. I ended up studying frantically like a candidate for some impending and important examination. During the weekends, when my housekeeper was not available, I attempted to put my daughter in the playpen 
on the lawn and sit outside to study. Since she strongly objected, this young Lalita, since she strongly objected to this and disturbed my papers, um, if I let her out, I sat in the playpen myself with my papers and let her hover around me quite happily. I have since learned that in the forests of Gir, the tourists remain in cages if they wish to see the lions roaming around. So you see, again, I mean, it's just amazing what she's, you know, the kind of fast thinking she has and the way she tackles each problem. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Adelaide brought out Raja Lakshmi's intellectual, uh, remarkable intellect, resilience, and ingenuity to the fore. Her contributions in both research and teaching were deeply appreciated by all who came in contact with her, but did not result in getting an independent faculty position at Baroda. On her return to Baroda, Raja Lakshmi applied for and received an honorary research position that had no remuneration. The position allowed her to study the effects of nutritional defici deficiency on psychological performances and brain biochemistry. She also studied the secretion of um, you know, um, absorbic acid during lactation. The problem Raja Lakshmi chose to work on uh, were of Im immense importance in a country with widespread malnutrition. Her, her work was driven by an impulse to find practical ways to alleviate the deleterious impact of low protein diets. In 1964, on her return from a second trip from Australia, Raja Lakshmi was finally offered a faculty, a full-time reader's position in psychometry and biometrics at Baroda University. This came about only after both Raja Lakshmi and Ramakrishnan were given positions at the Defense Institute of Physiology and Allied Sciences in Madras. So they could bargain for her position there. In 1969, she published Applied Nutrition that looked into Indian diets, available food grains, vegetables, and herbs. The book was and continues to be remarkably successful to this date. From this time onwards until 1986, the year of their retirement, Raja Lakshmi rose through the ranks, through the ranks to finally become the head of the Department of Biochemistry in 1984. So in conclusion, Raja Lakshmi's education and subsequent life in science is circumscribed first by the employment trajectory of her father and then by the exigencies of a husband's scientific career. Quote, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. This prescient quote from Marx is doubly true for women as they rearrange their lives to meet the expectations of their fathers and their husbands. Um, Raja Lakshmi's resilience was tested time and time again as she configured her life anew in different places and under different circumstances. Each time she took upon herself to learn new disciplines of science, new cultures that confronted her and made the most of it. Not until fairly late in her life did she get any kind of independent institutional support essential for self-respect as Dorothy Needham so eloquently explained through her own life in science. I want to say here that uh, feminist economists have drawn our attention to the unpaid work of the women in the reproductive sphere. The reproductive sphere entails not only biological reproduction, but also labor associated with household work, childcare, care of the elderly. 
Marilyn Waring, a political economist and author of If Women Counted, contends that the exclusion of everyday household work of women from considerations of national economic and productive activities is detrimental to achieving full gender equality. Here I want to suggest that a similar trend awaited women in science. It is as if the non-valuation as well as devaluation of re reproductive labor is transferred onto the productive sphere, where women need not expect remuneration, new remuneration for their intellectual labor. For the powers uh, that be, an enhanced social status of being a scientist should be compensation enough for women interested in pursuing intellectual um, you know, abilities and inter intellectual research. The French anthropologist Pierre Bordeaux distinguishes between four types of capital. Economic capital refers to money, property, and other assets. Social capital refers to networks of influence or support based on group membership, such as family, friends, or other contacts. Cultural capital refers to forms of knowledge, educational credentials, and skills. Symbolic capital refers to socially recognized legitimation, such as prestige or honor. Bordeaux links these various forms of capital by illustrating how social, cultural, and symbolic capital convert back into economic capital, end of quote. Indeed, the intellectual labor performed by Raja Lakshmi in her husband's laboratory did get compensated in the form of symbolic capital as she earned her students' respect and admiration. However, unlike for men, there was no easy fungibility of symbolic capital into economic or social capital for Raja Lakshmi. It required years of unpaid labor and more importantly, mediation by her husband for, uh, for Raja Lakshmi to get a position commensurate with her training and capabilities. So I, I want to, so here we started out uh, with um, Raja Lakshmi firmly identifying with the working class where women work in the fields um, at pittance, but at least they, they get something. Um, and so, and she's aware and she writes in her work about her becoming, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, instrumental for the care of her younger siblings, um, as well as their education, not only their care, but her edu their education. And all of this work, you know, this work of reproduction, work of care, is, goes uncompensated, really. And, you know, uh, Marilyn Waring, who I quoted earlier, has shown as to how much um, what a loss it is if you actually began to count the work women do in the reproductive sphere. You know, it's like somebody, I, I don't remember the exact um, reference here, said that, you know, if you look at the amount of walking women have to do to just fetch water across the world, it is like going to the moon. <laughs> you know, it's just really quite extraordinary, the things we take for granted. And, you know, and while Raja Lakshmi is living her life, I don't think she's thinking as to how insanely, uh, you know, path breaking it is in a way. It's just what we just get used to. We are so socialized into not, you know, worrying about that whether, you know, as long as we have a roof over our head, we have a family, et cetera, we persevere. But at the same time, if we want to think about gender equality, and other equalities, you know, whether it's caste, whether it's class, unless we begin to link, we begin to link the unpaid women, the work of women in all echelons of the society, because that is above and beyond, um, you know, what is expected of men. I mean, I don't know whether any of you have seen this um, uh, Sainath's film, where, you know, when he talks about the women, uh, farm workers, their life begins at four in the morning. 
where they get up to cook for their children, you know, take a bus all the way to get to work in the farm, come back, cook, and they go to sleep at 11, 4 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night, day after day after day. Uh, you know, and unless we begin to, 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 I think, feel enraged at that this is what is expected of women, we're not going to make much progress. In comparison to that, the lives of the likes of us are extraordinarily privileged. So even when I'm in awe of what Raja Lakshmi is doing, when we make these comparisons, which we must, you know, you begin to see um, that it is extraordinarily important that we try to link issues of class, caste, and gender, and, it's, and sexuality, because it's only then that we will begin to understand what, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, living uh, on the other side of the railroad tracks, as they say in this country, uh, you know, what it actually entails. So I think I want to stop here and see if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ava, for this wonderful lecture. Um, so I am still absorbing the things that you mentioned. It's, it's beautiful. And we have, I think, some comments already on, I think, the YouTube channel. And so let me just relay those to you. Um, so uh, At Atmaja uh, writes, thank you for the inspiring lecture. I feel women these days still have many of the Sorry, many of the same pressures as before. What would your advice be to women students with regards to dealing with such pressures? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, uh, in the absence of networks of solidarity, everybody's kind of makes their own choices and kind of struggles alone. So I would say that, you know, and I, I of course, grew up at the time of the feminist movement, a little bit later, but you know, they're just having groups of women connect to talk about commonalities of experience is just such a liberating thing that I would suggest that you develop these uh, friendships and sure. and um, you know groups where you can discuss these things where you would not feel so alone because you'd see that these are the problems that play the, most of the society. And then you have to kind of fight for your rights. Nobody's ever going to give you rights. These are not something handed down to us. Every time women have gotten anything, it is through struggle. So that's what I would suggest. Um, so I had, there is another um, maybe question or a comment from Renny Thomas. Uh, they say, hello, Abha, what an interesting lecture. Thanks for that. I was wondering if you think Rajalakshmi tried to see and do science differently, unlike the male scientists of her time, due to her training in philosophy, psychology, and literature. Did she at any point of time uh, think and write about the philosophical and methodological questions of science and try to challenge in her own ways the patriarchal nature of science in institutions, laboratories? Yeah. Uh, hi, Reni. Uh, that's what an interesting question. You know, uh, this, the very nature of scientific papers, which is all I've been able to read, you know, is that it kind of precludes any discussion of philosophy mm -hmm. or anything. So I, I would want to think that she does bring in her um, vast experiences into her science. I think her comments about the reverse, uh, you know, learning as to how that should be a mark of intelligence is an interesting aspect where she's thinking through some of these things. In her autobiographical essay, you, it's quite clear. It's kind of choppy in some ways, but you, as I started out in the beginning of my talk, she does try to connect what is happening politically to the country, what's happening with, you know, other acts in India in terms of marriage, when is, you know, uh, you know, they, they keep in, they rightly increase the age of marriage, etc. And what kind of impact that uh, that makes on society. So you can see that, but in the science itself, I think it's the, it's what she chooses to concentrate on. And here, I think one 
my sense is uh, that she and her husband both were very much part of developing these uh, programs where you're looking at what if you, you know, you're, you do not have a protein rich diet or you have poor protein, you know, poor, poor quality of protein, whether you could add supplements that would, you know, reverse the uh, uh, negative effects of such things. So the work for both um, Rajalakshmi and her husband Ramakrishnan is very much driven by um, the ways in which uh, they see the world around them and see the need for addressing some of the problems of malnutrition in the country. And her book also, again, is a testament to that, which I have yet to read. <laughs> So it's just, I'm just beginning to think through some of her life. Um, so there is an uh, interesting question from Rishi K. Um, he says, thank you for such a lovely talk. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on how you understand caste as intersecting with her experience of being a woman in science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that, um, it's only, you know, that throwaway sentence that she was teaching um, she wrote Harijan, Dalit Boys. So she's very, very, I think she writes a little bit more in her autobiographical thing about, you know, sort of also, if I remember correctly, it was a long time ago, that, you know, sort of she's aware of caste politics at that time. It's not, and she is, of course, sympathetic, but we have a very different understanding of solidarities today uh, than we had there. So I, I do not know it for, for a fact, but my sense is that she might well have a little bit of paternalistic um, mm -hmm. attitude towards that. But I, I, we need to do much more research uh, on that. But certainly, she is very influenced by Gandhi at that time. She's influenced by, you know, the need to do social work in the earlier part of her life. And as she moves into a more scientific career, of course, you know, that drops off in any case. So. Okay, so then Nitin Singh is asking, what would, you, uh, what would you advise men who want to try to ensure gender equality for their spouses and daughters now and in the future, especially in a system worldwide really, which is stacked against this ethos? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a million dollar question. And of course we can begin with very simple steps of helping with, you know, uh, the care work, helping with cooking, cleaning, whatever you have to do, of course. We are also aware, and in, in India in particular, where we have help, which, you know, takes care of a lot of these issues. But then, as I said, that, you know, a gender equality is possible if we have, if we have also um, other kinds of equalities present, right? Because, we can always um, outsource, which is the wor word in, in, in our present times, all of this care work, you know, um, which already sets up the boundaries about whose work is counted and who's not, etc. So I think for me, um, you know, of course, being aware of gender discrimination and doing everything you can to, to, to answer that within your, um, you know, uh, and, and violence is very important. But at the same time, we also need to, which, which I, you know, have to keep harping upon, solidarities across class. Um, and because it is really, if you think about the life of um, Raja Lakshmi and compared to the life of a farm worker, who I also told you that, you know, I mean, at least from this one, uh, this thing, the extraordinarily hard life people lead. What happens to their children? How are we going to, what happens to their little girls, you know? Um, how would you ever change uh, ch child marriages? Because it, I mean, when I was looking into it and as I'm thinking about it, you know, if you have so much responsibility in your own household as a, a, a working class woman, you would probably look forward to having less people to look after, mm. you know? I mean, so we have to create conditions where mm. change is possible. And there you have to not work alone, but work in solidarity with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, Roop Gatha Bhattacharya uh, wants to know if you could share a link to the paper by Megha Harish uh, that you mentioned. Um, so Megha Harish, you'll have to go to the Cambridge University site for dissertation. She did a, a paper. She looked at three women, Kamla Soni and uh, Al, uh, Raja Lakshmi, and, um, and I, the third name escapes me right now. Um, I don't know that, uh, I mean, I could look it up and, and send it. It's not um, readily available to me, but I think the dissertation is online. Okay, um, so uh, there is CS306 lab evaluation. I don't know if that is a, I, okay, doesn't matter. Uh, they say, thank you for such an inspiring talk. Uh, why, what would you suggest for undergraduate women in science, the best approach to start off their research career? Yeah, I think that just from um, somebody who's been in, um, in sciences for a long period, um, I think often undergraduates are, you know, I'm just talking about just, uh, it's, it's not um, just an advice that I might give to my own daughter or son, um, but, but it's just when you look for a PhD advisor, you want to do your uh, homework. You want to go try to talk to as many people to see what kind of um, you know, cultural, uh, what, what is the culture in the laboratory? Sometimes it could be very, uh, you know, a supportive environment, sometimes not so supportive. Also the other, you know, the other people in the laboratory and more importantly, in this, in this today's days of connectivity and all, you might want to look at the productivity of the scientists you're going to be working with because often people join a lab because they like the person etc and they find that their you know productive days have been in the past etc so those are just you know as as a scholar uh, or budding scholar you you those are the issues that you want to pay attention to yeah yeah that's perfect so uh Alec Ray wants to know is there data about women with caste and class disadvantages who came into science and managed to do well in Indian science during the 2000s or before? Yeah, I mean, I think these require a lot of uh, digging around. I, I wouldn't even know myself and, you know, where to begin. Um, because, you know, sort of, um, when was it that they were trying to put caste, you know, the enumeration of caste was kind of voted down upon? Uh, uh, you know, earlier in the mm. in recent in the recent past, so that I don't know where one would get that data. I mean, that mm. is a problem that plagues, I think, a lot of universities uh, right now with uh, with reservations and everything. Uh, there, we still uh, do not know what the numbers are, especially among the faculty. And mm. I've heard many many people say that. The assumption is that everybody who's on the faculty is upper caste in all kinds of ways in which um, really god awful things are talked about and said and, and there is not much, you know, you don't have much recourse because science kind of shuts its door to talking about issues of gender and caste very much because they, they think it's a distraction from their single minded quest towards that and I've been hearing a lot more concerns about how do we break that barrier um, and uh, you know I mean so so this is this is going to require uh, creating atmospheres in universities where people feel comfortable talking about um, not just how great they are which they often do but about the difficulties that they have encountered and unless we can create spaces like that, um, you know, it would remain extremely hard. Then we would just, you know, if the culture doesn't change, then we reproduce, regardless of what your personal identity might be, we reproduce the same culture, mm -hmm. which makes it impossible for people from disadvantaged backgrounds to, um, to, to talk openly about their uh, condition. Uh, so there is a very long comment from Pushpa Kharkwal. I was wondering if Pushpa, you would like to unmute yourself and say it yourself. I think that may be easier. 
Pushpa, do you want to unmute, unmute yourself and speak? Okay, I don't think she's there anymore. So the, let me just read Siti, it anyway. I summarized her comment uh, to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, so um, she say, she's a writer and she's writing a book called Main Pilot Banna Chahti Hoon. And she wants to, she, uh, she's asking to please share the names of all the scientists and feminists you mentioned in the lecture. So, oh. uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> there weren't that many, were there? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, Aurati Needham is uh, the one I mentioned. And then I mentioned Marilyn Baring as an uh, economist. Anyway, yeah. It, just write to me and I'll be able to I think that's, answer. yeah, I, we'll see if we can actually use this information and maybe publicize it someplace. Okay, um, there is another, uh, Indumati uh, says, thank you for the talk. One could draw parallels to Raja Lakshmi Steins and women in science in the current times. What changes have you seen in your lifetime? What changes have I seen? I, I certainly think that, I mean, I've been in the US now for for many, many years, um, so, and, and, and in India as well, when I come and visit, um, there are many schemes to, um, to encourage women in science. And I, I think some of it is, um, it is the outcome of feminist struggles that have taken place. But I also think that a lot of it is driven by the needs of the modern state, as we look at the world and the need for more technically or scientific uh, personnel, technical and scientific personnel is going to be increasing. And what we find is that women are doing out, <laughs> you know, uh, performing men, um, at least in the younger ages. So I think that there are a combination of things. There is always the struggle and also now the needs of the modern state, which make, um, make it possible for women to, to be successful. And I, you know, MIT is a very good example. And in fact, uh, if you think about it, there were hardly any women uh, 20, 30 years ago at MIT. And right now it's 50-50, mm. the, the proportion of mm. men to women uh, entering the class is pretty close to 50-50. Mm. But in IITs in India, which are comparable, I guess, it is abysmal the number of women. And it's really kind of surprising that that would remain the case, you know? I mean, um, so I think it has to do a lot with the kind of examination. It's a whole system, it's not just one thing um, at all. Um, but certainly there's much more opening today than was there before. Um, but, but when I think of gender equality, when I think about those issues, I also think about um, not just numerical proportions, but rather what kind of culture we are promoting. And, um, you know, the culture in the sciences is quite competitive. There are, you know, people do collaborate, but at the same time, it's all driven by publication. It's all driven by priority, et cetera. It is not driven by what we might call science for the people in a way. So, so unless we can change those as we demand greater representation of women and minorities, things are going to not change a whole lot because after all, it's a small proportion of the, wor you know, the world's population that will do science regardless. You know? so, so in that sense, I think I, my, um, I take a rather broad view of what equality might look like. Um, so, Rupkata wants to know, how do we address the patriarchal mindset seen among some women researchers in science in India? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, just to uh, associate patriarchal norms with men is absolutely wrong, because after all, it's the women that are repositories of culture. And we are taught at a very, very early age not to rock the bottom uh, boat. We inadvertently or advertently you know, end up supporting structures through our actions. And again, it's not going to happen over time because these cultures have a huge staying power. And sometimes even when we make progress, it can 
be, you know, taken back. There's not a linear progression towards pro progress. So, so I think we have to continuously fight for it. We have to continuously um, be in environments. We try to create environments that are supportive. We need to reach out to people. We need to create conditions where at least dialogue is possible. In, you know, so, you know, it's, it's a, any struggle is a arduous thing, but that's what we need to do at the end of it all. And uh, we'll sometimes sorry. regress, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Keep no, no, go ahead. No, no, I'm done. <laughs> okay. I was going to request Geeta to maybe unmute herself and uh, ask the question. Geeta? Maybe, okay, let me see if I can unmute her. Oops. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Geeta. Hi, Geeta. Hi. Hi, Abha. What a lovely, lovely uh, little talk with so much, uh, so many questions and so much in it, my question to you was simply that when we, uh, as uh, feminists, uh, women, we write biographies, whether of uh, women scientists or even men scientists, is there mm -hmm. something you think is unique? Because, you know, I've been, we, one, one hears a lot about retrieving, you know, women scientists of an early generation, retrieving their histories and life stories. And there's a purpose with which we do that. But I was uh, curious if you could speak a little bit about your own craft and your own practice when you're writing uh, biographies like Rajalakshmi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I uh, unfortunately did not have any formal training in the disciplines that I am now involved with. Uh, either as, you know, gender studies in which I teach actually, but these are all kind of self-taught in some ways, but not self, that would be wrong, but also through um, association with a number of uh, women scholars, feminist scholars from across different disciplines. And so my own trajectory is quite, um, to use, you know, is, has been quite unorthodox in the sense that I don't have very strong, um, you know, sort of disciplinary training, you know. Uh, so, so when I um, look at, the one thing I do when I'm looking at the biography, and this is, you know, uh, with Raja Lakshmi's work, is that I need to do much more of that before it's ready for, uh, you know, to be shown to the world, would be to read her scientific papers and try to understand what she's trying to do, because often when we, um, you know, the autobiography, we were lucky that she herself wrote, but it's also important to think through uh, how, you know, maybe talk to people in Baroda about her time there, uh, what did her students think of her, because after all, when you are going to write your own autobiography, you're not going to write anything negative. Also learn to read between lines and interpret and be upfront about whether, you know, this is, my reading of it, you know, um, et cetera. So um, I think it's, and you know, I don't even sometimes know where to begin, but what is true these days is because of large interconnectivity, when people find out about your work, then they kind of lead you to other people, um, you know, and then they'll tell you, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? She was in my family. I mean, again, it is, also, you know, the circles we move in, um, you know, uh, that, that makes it possible. So I really don't have a set methodology through which I approach these issues, mainly because there are no archives to look at. So when I found Raja Lakshmi's, you know, uh, Megha Harish's thesis, because I happened to know her advisor, and she told me about it, you know, it was... A learning experience for me and then um, you know I've been actually for the last few years I've been uh, you know uh, engaging with the work of Mahala Nobis it was not necessarily uh, you know women scientists that I was going to look at but it, it's such an intriguing life that I kind of got interested in doing so I think I'm kind of rambling right now but uh, which is what I I, you're, you're, I think your question um, is a 
important one and maybe we need to sit together to see if we can facilitate the way in which, you know, not you and me, but a, a, a slew of uh, scholars to think about what might be um, uh, ways to recover or to, to think about these biographies. Sorry, okay. Um, um, so, uh, Neeta Taneja wants to know the name of a, the paper about ascorbic acids and lactation. I think you probably oh. mentioned this in uh, maybe in the talk. <clears throat> I think if you go to Google Scholar okay. and type these keywords, you will get it. Off. You know, I really don't remember it off the top. So, um, maybe uh, since in the interest of time, since we only have five minutes left, I just want to ask maybe the last question. Unless um, there are two questions, maybe I'll ask both of them. Uh, Anupama Gupta wants to know, wants to say, uh, uh, she says, thanks for such, in, such an informative and interesting talk. Uh, Ma'am, what uh, is the main cause for more female students up to, uh, up to undergraduate and PG levels, but in research, female students, students not up to mark? So they're not up to mark uh, at the later stages. Uh, they're not up to mark by I, who's Yes. This is the question to ask. And also we have to, you know, again, I keep coming back to the, we have to link the reproductive sphere with the productive sphere in a way, because, you know, if sometimes there are huge demands on uh, women scientists with the demands of, you know, the scientific career yeah. and the childbearing uh, age coincides quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we kind of make it possible for women um, to do both? And, and what is this, again, again, we have to think about the culture of science here also. What is this hurry that, you know, that, you know, I mean, there are, I mean, I, I teach in an institution where routinely labs run for almost 24 hours a day because people are expected to be in to the VRs of the morning and there's enough immense pressure, the competitive nature of science um, makes it, you know, very hard for people who are not competitive mm -hmm. to, to, to make a huge difference. And then, um, and we have to ask why, why do we need that? You know, the intellectual pursuit should be pleasurable, should be, you know, and, and why not work in collaboration rather than in competition? So these are all, I sort of uh, lump them with this culture of science, which has to change in my opinion for everybody to feel a part of it. Sure, sure. So I think uh, I'll just take one last question, which is from Tarun Ram uh, Kanuri. Um, he says, what can a male science or tech student do to help in this? Uh, which type of efforts can really help us, uh, I think to create maximum impact? Is there a way to change this drastically and quickly? Quickly, no. But the fact that you're already asking that question is a step in the right direction. And I think, you know, um, you know, there is, you know, there is a way in which uh, small little changes that suddenly magnify and make a huge impact. Uh, that's the way in which, you know, the world functions in some ways. So, so just being aware seeking out people, trying to do the best you can. And again, not in isolation, but with your cohorts um, would be uh, a way to, to, to be in the world. Perfect. I think uh, we probably have to stop the discussion here. Thank you so much, Abha, for making time for us. And I hope we can reach out to you for resources and references. I, there are a lot of demands for that. So I hope we can reach out to you for that. Um, and uh, maybe we'll provide that information somewhere publicly. Um, okay, I think that's all. So